When it comes to the history of the children of the Great Hunger, the plight of thousands of orphans shipped to Australia dominates the narrative. In the later years of the Great Famine, Henry George Grey, the British Secretary of State for the Colonies, devised a scheme that shipped over 4,100 female orphans from Irish workhouses to Australia. There has been intense debate about the motives behind this scheme. While death rates in Irish workhouses were shocking, the plight of these young women in Australia left a lot to be desired. Many were married off to much older men. Nevertheless, the Earl Grey scheme, named after its architect, is widely remembered in both Ireland and Australia. Work has been done to trace the descendants of the thousands of orphans, while memorials have been erected in both countries. However, what's often overlooked is the plight of the orphans who were not selected for this scheme. Because those shipped to Australia were only a tiny minority of those orphaned by the Great Hunger. By 1851, after the Earl Grey scheme ended, there were still nearly 90,000 children without parents in Irish workhouses. Many of them would spend their formative years in these institutions. By the end of the 1850s, they had little hope for the future, and this would lead to what authorities at the time called rebellions, mutinies and insurrections in Irish workhouses. This podcast tells the story of those orphans. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer. Now in today's show we're returning to the story of the Great Hunger. And if you're a new listener to the Irish History Podcast, I do have a full series on the Great Hunger in the back catalogue from around 2016 to 2018. Apologies for last week, there was no show. That's because I was a bit sick and my voice was completely gone. You might be able to hear now, it's just coming back. But that explains why there was no show last week. I hope you had a really great Paddy's Day, whatever you were doing. Sound on today's show is by Case Dunley. In November 1855, the 31-year-old Englishwoman, Anne Fitzpatrick, arrived at the door of the South Dublin workhouse with her nine-year-old son, James. Like all people who sought aid in the workhouse, the pair were destitute, but they had the most unusual of stories to tell. Even for the workhouse officials, who had heard tens of thousands of accounts of hardship during the Great Hunger, the Fitzpatrick's story took them aback. Anne Fitzpatrick and her son James were not from Ireland and only had the most tangential of connections to the country. Anne had been born and raised in the English city of Leeds and she had lived her entire life in England. Around 1845, she had married an Irish immigrant, William Fitzpatrick, and they had had a son together around a year later, that boy James. Anne's life, however, had been upended in March 1853, when her husband William had died. This left her in severe financial difficulty. She had moved initially to the nearby city of Bradford, where she was able to live with her aunt, but she still struggled. Over the following year, she became dependent on the local workhouse in Bradford for sustenance. However, when the Bradford Workhouse authorities looked into her case, they insisted Anne was not their responsibility. They would argue that given she had married an Irishman, she was the responsibility, or burden as they saw it, of her late husband's family and community back in Ireland. This was, of course, an Ireland that was still reeling in the aftermath of the Great Hunger. Nevertheless, in 1855, Anne Fitzpatrick and her son James neither of whom had ever set foot in Ireland, were taken to the port of Liverpool and deported from England to Dublin on a steamship. Now what Anne would find when she reached Ireland was hard to summarise in a few words. While she had undoubtedly heard of the Great Hunger, by the mid-1850s, the rate of recovery defied expectations and many visitors to Ireland were somewhat surprised. As early as 1854, government officials who were carefully monitoring the Irish economy noted how wages were increasing and the agricultural sector, where most people were working, was doing well. The potato harvest, which remained the primary source of food for the poor, was also bountiful. However, it was when Anne reached Mount Mellick, County Leash, the town where her late husband was born, where she would come face to face with some of the longer-term impacts of the Great Hunger. It had devastated wider Irish society, 
and it was clear from Anne Fitzpatrick's experience that it would take decades to recover. The Mount Melek she found was not the place her husband had described when he had talked of home. Indeed, had her husband William been alive to see it, he would have been shocked by the town Anne found in the 1850s. Her husband William had left Ireland before the Great Hunger and everything had changed since. The famine years had devastated Mount Melek and the surrounding area. One in three people were dead or gone. In 1841, the population of the surrounding region had been around 65,000 people. By 1851, that number had fallen to 50,000. And through the 1850s, the pace of decline did not slow. Each year, thousands were emigrating. On a more intimate and personal level, Anne found that the Fitzpatricks, her husband's kin, who she hoped would provide for her and her son, were nowhere to be found. She was informed that the family members who had survived the Great Hunger had long since emigrated to England themselves. Now alone in the world, all Anne Fitzpatrick and her son could do was turn heel and retrace their steps. However, when they reached Dublin, Anne knew they had reached the end of the road. They were in many respects trapped in the port. They had no money to return to England and even if they could, they could expect little help there. Desperate, Anne and her son James would turn to the only place left, the South Dublin workhouse, in the hope that they would treat her better than the workhouse officials in Bradford had. Thankfully, they did take pity on Anne Fitzpatrick and her son and they were admitted to the workhouse in November 1855. Now, in the South Dublin workhouse, Anne Fitzpatrick came face to face with one of the most shocking legacies of the Great Hunger in the late 1850s, and that was what seemed to be an entire generation of children who were orphaned. These were children who had survived, but their parents or families had not, or for one reason or another, they had been separated from their families. The numbers of these children in Irish workhouses in the 1850s was staggering. In 1851, there had been 225,000 children in Irish workhouses and of these, around one-third, about 88,000, were there without their parents. I should also say that in a workhouse at the time, the definition of a child was 14 years or younger. Now, by the time Anne Fitzpatrick arrived in Ireland, the great hunger had eased somewhat and the numbers of children in workhouses had fallen somewhat. So in 1855, there were about 72,000 children in Irish workhouses, but half of these now were unaccompanied by their parents. The fact that single children without parents were becoming a larger and larger percentage of the overall child population in Irish workhouses hints at the fact that they were struggling to leave these institutions. It stands to reason though, without their parents, these children had nowhere to go and no way of supporting themselves if they left. Now of the children she encountered in the South Dublin workhouse, Anne Fitzpatrick would have heard a variety of different experiences of the Great Hunger. Some had been completely orphaned, having lost both parents to hunger and disease. There was also a large cohort of children in the workhouse who the authorities would describe as deserted by their parents. This, however, was a very simplistic explanation of what had happened. In many cases, the decision to leave their children at the workhouse had been forced on the parents rather than one they had willingly chosen. For example, widowed parents often struggled to raise their families on their own. They might leave their children in the workhouse as they couldn't afford to feed them and they hoped to return at a later point. There were, of course, children whose parents did desert them, but even here the reasons could be more complicated than we might imagine. Parents desperate to leave Ireland but couldn't afford passage for all their children might in some instances, decide to leave some behind. Now, for the children themselves, their route to the workhouse was of cold comfort to them. They found themselves in an institution that was no substitute for a home or family. Now, the Englishwoman Anne Fitzpatrick would spend the Christmas of 1855 in the South Dublin workhouse and then leave in early 1856. However, whatever plans she had seemed to have fallen through. She would return in a matter of weeks this time taking refuge in Dublin's other workhouse on the north side of the River Liffey. What would happen to Anne in the longer term is unclear. She doesn't appear to have spent much time in Dublin's workhouses after 1856. Indeed, she had good reason to leave the workhouse that year and try and survive outside its walls. Tragically, her son John died 
in the North Dublin workhouse in March 1856. But also, workhouses in Ireland in the later 1850s were becoming increasingly dangerous places. Towards the end of that decade, the generation, orphaned by the Great Hunger, many of whom could not remember any home other than the institution they were living in, were nearing adulthood. Their anger at a world that rejected them would see the workhouses rocked by protests, rebellions and insurrections, often defined by a hopelessness that could lead to dangerous outcomes. There was always a lingering tension and a hint of violence in workhouses. The destitute were treated poorly, fed badly, looked down upon and blamed for their own misfortune by the authorities. This led to outbreaks of violence, but in the late 1850s, the authorities who ran workhouses in Ireland became increasingly concerned about the actions of younger inmates, particularly in the South Dublin workhouse. A good example of this were the actions of a young woman called Jane Kane. Born in 1838, she arrived in the South Dublin workhouse just as the Great Hunger was receding in 1852, and after this she became a more or less permanent resident in the institution. Workhouse officials would claim her mother was alive but operated a brothel, but whatever the case, Jane was in effect an orphan from 1852 onwards. She received two prison sentences in 1856 and 1857 for breaking windows and slates at the workhouse, but her rebelliousness would escalate in 1858. In August, now aged 20, she refused to eat the workhouse rations, saying she deserved better. She then broke 16 windows in the workhouse in protest, saying she was determined to have value of some description in the institution. This would land her a month in prison. Now, on her release, Jane had no option but to return to the workhouse she hated. But quickly, she was involved in a far more serious incident in January 1859. On that occasion, she and two other teenagers, Mary Keeley and Mary Maher, would attempt to burn down the workhouse. Labelled a workhouse mutiny by newspapers, the three had been caught trying to set the straw in their mattresses alight using a gas lamp. When a workhouse official walked in and attempted to stop them, the three women assaulted her and tried to continue. They were eventually stopped, but not before they had smashed 42 panes of glass. Tried before the courts, they would all plead guilty, but the judge noted none appeared to be contrite or sorry. When asked why they had tried to burn down the workhouse, Jane Kane explained how the three had been locked up in a hospital dormitory on the condition they would be released after a month if they were good. However, the authorities had left them there, so Kane, Keeley and Marr tried to burn the workhouse because, in Jane's words, she was sick and tired of being punished. While Jane Kane's actions showed the signs of extreme frustration, disillusionment and institutionalisation, she was by no means unique around this time. In June 1859, two separate incidents saw the 26-year-old Bridget MacDonald and the 21-year-old Jane Hanlon assault a ward mistress and break windows in separate incidents. They wanted to leave the workhouse, but the only alternative they could envisage was prison, which many in the workhouse did see as a better alternative. This would see inmates in workhouses commit crimes in the hope they would receive custodial sentences. Now the growing discontent among the children orphaned by the Great Hunger as they became adults was also enhanced by their treatment in workhouses, which was often brutal. This would in fact lead to a major riot in the South Dublin workhouse in April 1860. This riot was sparked by disillusionment and mistreatment of the young women when staff members carried out an invasive search of the inmates who had reportedly been stealing extra clothing from the laundry in order to make larger dresses that were in fashion at the time. Now the Catholic chaplain of the South Dublin workhouse, Father Fox, was a witness to the search and he would call it scandalous, abominable and obscene treatment of the women. When some of the teenage girls resisted, male staff members grabbed them and pulled them to the ground. One teenager was thrown very forcibly between two benches and her dress pulled up. This would trigger a major riot. Several young women launched an attack on the workhouse officials, throwing glass jars, plates and anything else they could get their hands on. They eventually would force their way into the exercise yard in the workhouse where they began throwing stones at the officials 
and smashing windows around them. Eventually, the police were called and several of these young women were arrested and sent to jail for various spells. Now, the violent, intense atmosphere in the workhouse continued into the early 1860s. In August 1862, 14 girls aged between 14 and 17 were arrested after they attempted to set fire to the workhouse. The reason they said they did this is because they had been locked up for what was deemed unruly behaviour. In protest against this, they had piled their beds up and lit them on fire and then broke into the exercise yard. Two of the young women, who were considered ringleaders, received a five-year prison sentence, while the other 12 received four years. Now, the Dublin Evening Mail, a newspaper at the time, commented that the girls seemed pleased by this outcome and were happy to leave the workhouse, which they now were calling the House of Persecution. While some were happy to be sent to one of the many jails across Dublin, to escape the workhouse, others did have more ambitious plans for a new life. One inmate in the workhouse testified about the attempt to burn down the building and said that she had heard some of the girls saying they were hopeful they would be transported to Australia. However, this only revealed how isolated these young women were from the wider world. Female transportation as a punishment had ceased nearly a decade earlier. The most serious of all incidents involving this generation of famine orphans took place in the South Dublin Workhouse in the third week of November 1862. It started on Tuesday, November 16th when the police were called after two young adult men, James Mitchell and Patrick Riley, tried to set fire to the dormitory they shared with 73 others. The recklessness and hopelessness of such an act demonstrated the attitude many of these people had. They knew no other life than the workhouse. While Mitchell and Riley were arrested, two nights later a major insurrection involving 80 young men broke out. They set several fires across the workhouse and the staff lost total control of the institution. The master of the workhouse would eventually have to dispatch messengers to the Richmond Army Barracks and soldiers from the 45th and 54th Regiment were brought up. By the time they arrived, the revolt had more or less been put down by the police. Large numbers of constables from the Royal Irish Constabulary had carried out dozens of arrests of teenagers and young adults while the fire brigade contained the fire. This would lead, however, to major trials and prison sentences were handed down to 15 teenagers and 11 young men in their early 20s. Now, by the early 1860s, the problems in Irish workhouses were becoming so serious that they could no longer be ignored by wider Victorian society, the normal default reaction they had to the poor in workhouses. The Board of Guardians in South Dublin Workhouse the body who ran the institution and received most blame, would make a ludicrous assertion that the unrest was in fact caused by a conspiracy fomented by the Catholic Church. There had been long-running tensions between successive Catholic chaplains and the authorities in the South Dublin workhouse, but such allegations were not taken seriously at the time. The poor law commissioners who oversaw the entire workhouse system across the island took a slightly more grounded, if misdirected, approach to the issue in their annual report in 1863. They speculated on the reasons behind the riots and attributed them to boredom, wanting a change of scenery and the lack of hard labour. Now, one of the few people to identify what appears to have been really the core of the issue was the superintendent of Mountjoy Women's Prison, Delia Lidwell. She raised the rebelliousness of the famine orphans in a roundabout way in her report to the director of prisons in 1859. She stated that the most difficult prisoners she encountered in Mountjoy Jail were the young women who had spent prolonged periods in or were reared in Irish workhouses. Now in the 1850s, this was precisely young women who had been orphaned during or after the Great Hunger. Lidwell said these young women had a perverse tendency to mischief and a spirit of reckless insubordination. She went on to say how they refused any advice or punishment. If she attempted to correct them, they lost, in Lidwell's words, all control of reason. While this helps understand the unrest in workhouses, no one at the time analysed the impact of the hardships these children and young adults had endured, but they can only have been severely traumatised by what they had experienced and the sense of neglect and abandonment given their lives. For example, Isaac Roberts was one of those imprisoned for his role in the rebellion in the South Dublin workhouse in November 1862. He had first come to the institution in 1853 with his mother. He would return in 1854 but was now listed as deserted. By 1862, he had been in and out of the workhouse 10 times 
and served two prison sentences without any reference to another family member. Andrew Bartley was another of those involved in that rebellion and he had a similar life to Isaac Roberts. He arrived in the workhouse at the age of 14, alone. The workhouse officials never made reference to his family and he would spend several spells in the workhouse over the following years. Many of the young women involved in protests had similar lives. Mary Keeley, who tried to burn down the South Dublin workhouse in 1858, had first come to the workhouse in 1855. She had been 15 years of age at the time and considered an adult, so no detail was provided about her life. However, in the following three years, this teenager, alone in the world, would rotate between the workhouse and prison. Another young woman, Ellen Collins, who had tried to start a fire in the South Dublin workhouse, had first come to the institution at the age of five in 1846 and would spend 15 different spells there in the following 13 years. For most of these young adults, they could scarcely remember a person who had taken an interest in their lives or cared for them. They were regarded as a burden by the workhouse authorities, whose primary responsibility was to ensure expenditure was maintained at as low as possible rate. The only loyalties these teenagers often had was to each other. They did have the same life experiences and understood what they had been through. It is worth bearing in mind that some of these children had no knowledge or memory whatsoever of their own family. A report from the late 1850 anonymously recorded the life of one 16-year-old girl who had spent the previous 10 years in Dublin workhouses. She could not remember her mother who had brought her there and had a vague sense that she might have had some brothers in Kilkenny but had no known relatives. Indeed, even for those who could remember their families and where they had come from, they had no guarantee that those communities they remembered as children even existed anymore. The very villages where they had grown up might have been destroyed by famine clearances which had seen hundreds of thousands of people evicted from their homes. Anne Fitzpatrick, who we met at the start of the episode, was just one example. When she returned to the community where her husband had been born, she found that his family were dead or emigrated. These factors go a long way to explaining why the children orphaned by the famine, were so alienated and disillusioned by society when they were reaching their late teenage years and early adulthood in the late 1850s. Now while this episode has heavily focused on the South Dublin workhouse, which undoubtedly faced the worst problems, it wasn't unique. 1862 had seen inmates attempt to burn down workhouses at Clonmel, Waterford and Cork, but there have been multiple examples of major and minor protests in Irish workhouses across the island in the later 1850s and 1860s involving this age group. A particularly tragic aspect of this generation, however, was that they had become so institutionalised that they were terrified of normal society. This left them in an impossible situation. They hated the workhouse, but they couldn't survive outside it. This dilemma came to national attention in June 1861, when the South Dublin Workhouse tried to ban some of the more troublesome young women from the institution. Unable to envisage a world outside of the workhouse, they turned to a temporary refuge called St Joseph's Night Refuge. Now this was run by a Dr Spratt who raised the plight of the girls with the British government's representative in Ireland, the Lord Lieutenant, the Earl of Carlisle. Spratt explained that the four were aged between 16 and 19 and had all been in the workhouse since they were small children. He gave his word that these young women would be well behaved if they were allowed to return, and the decision was overturned, and they were let back into the workhouse. However, Delia Lidwell's statement that they had a spirit of reckless insubordination would be proved correct. Within two days of re-entering the workhouse, two of these young women, Sarah Burton and Eliza Moore, were arrested for trying to break another teenager out of confinement and sent back to prison. Perhaps the most tragic of all cases, though, were the children who were so institutionalised by the workhouse that they literally fought to remain inside it. In 1860, John Clark, described as a pauper boy who had been in Mullingar workhouse since he was two years of age, was sent to prison for breaking glass and threatening to kill the workhouse master. His reasons were his fears of the outside world. The workhouse authorities had found him a job, but Clark was so institutionalised he didn't want to leave the workhouse. In another similar case from 1860, a girl in Cork City workhouse refused to take a job because she had been in the workhouse 13 years and knew no other life. In the mid-1860s, the workhouses 
across Ireland calmed somewhat. The general numbers of those in the workhouse was beginning to drop, which must have relieved tensions. But also, that generation of famine orphans were beginning to age out. Many of them were now in their mid to late twenties. Tracing their later lives is difficult. There must have been many who, against the odds, did manage to find a place in wider society. There are hints that lots continued to struggle. The most striking statistic in this regard is the dramatic increase in those incarcerated in asylums in the later 19th century. It's important to acknowledge there are multiple reasons behind the huge rates of incarceration in mental asylums in Ireland in the late 19th century, not least the growing interest in and stigmatisation of people suffering from mental illness. However, there must have been a legacy of the great hunger and the trauma it inflicted on people as well. One later 19th century doctor did speculate on this when talking about the rapid rise of mental illness in Ireland in the late 19th century. He said, It seems probable that children born and partially reared amidst the horrors of the famine and epidemics of disease that followed it were so handicapped in their nervous equipment as to be weak-minded from the start or fall victim to mental disease. While this doctor was not specifically talking about orphans, it's hard to imagine a more traumatised group who had endured and survived the great hunger than those orphaned by it and who would go on to spend most of their childhood in workhouses. Unfortunately, asylum records are sealed and treated as patient records, so it's impossible to trace individual cases we've talked about today to see if they did end up in asylums. Perhaps the last indicator we have of these people in Irish society is in the age profile of Irish workhouses at the end of the 19th century. In the 1850s, in the aftermath of the Great Hunger, it had been overwhelmingly young, with these orphans forming a large minority of all workhouse inhabitants. However, by the turn of the 20th century, the demographic in workhouses had changed considerably. It was now overwhelmingly older. Workhouses were by this point somewhere many older people had to turn when their working lives came to an end if they did not have families or resources to care for them in later life. Now this means famine orphans were by no means the only people in workhouses or even a majority of the people there. However, given they had limited skills when they left those institutions as adults in the 1860s, this increased the risk that they would find themselves marginalised in society, leaving them vulnerable then in later life. Understanding the later lives of these people whose childhoods were so traumatised by the Great Hunger requires far more research and perhaps it's something I'll be able to return to in a later episode. I'm going to post a fully referenced transcript of this episode on Patreon. You'll be able to find it at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan. 